Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Plus Cast with your host Taylor. Very excited uh, for today's guest. We have the amazing Alex Brightman with us. Hello Taylor. Hello everybody. Hello Plus Cast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. I am uh, sitting in my office slash second bedroom trying to get some work done and also trying to find a better work-life balance for myself in general. Yeah work-life balance is important and it's I think I feel like it's very hard when we're all working at home and working from our bedrooms right when you're when you're working from your life it's hard to find the balance you're working inside of where you also live it's yeah. uh, sometimes difficult but 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 you know we've, we've been about two years of trying to do that so I'm, I'm mi minorly successful at it thus far so we've got some questions that we're going to ask you um, and then we're going to do a little quick fire round. Uh, oh, I am notoriously terrible at those, but I'm very excited about it. So the first question, obviously you've originated a couple of roles in musicals, which is amazing. How does yeah. it feel to have created quite a few of these iconic roles and have you got any audition stories or uh, how you got the job kind of things that you can share with us about those? I, I didn't realize the value in creating an original role really until I was doing it. And I even think maybe until I was in the middle of doing it. And this, I'm not speaking of School of Rock or um, Beetlejuice because I, I did a show called Big Fish where I got to originate a role. Um, it wasn't one of the leading roles, but every single person in that show got to originate something. So it was the first time I found the value in like putting your stamp on something that is gonna happen not just once because it's gonna happen multiple times. So it's, for me, I really, discovered how much I loved doing that. Um, and then sort of retroactively figured out like I was built for that. Like I'm really based around improv comedy and really thrive when it comes to making things up where there weren't things there. I don't necessarily always need a script. I do love a script to play off of, but I really, really love playing around and just seeing what's there. And, and so that's been a really big joy that not only have people let me do it, but encourage me to do it. So that's been uh, sincerely a dream and I don't say that to be hyperbolic I really I, I think a lot of people's dream is to do the thing they really love to do at a professional level that's very hard to do you can always do the things you love and you can always have a profession but I think rarely do you get to do the thing you love so much and actually make it a job so that's been really um really really exciting to be able to do that um the, the really the only big story that I think goes with the originating thing is in School of Rock I was coming off of doing Matilda. So I was in the best shape of my life. I had like nearly a six pack in, in, in that kind of shape because that show is so physically strenuous and so much dancing. And you just, you know, that's your cardio for the day and every day. So I was coming off of that and, and um, then auditioning for School of Rock. And I really didn't look the part, to be quite honest. I looked a lot more like you, actually. Like I really did. I had sort of a very baby face because I, I had to shave every day for Matilda. And I was like much skinnier and much smaller looking just in general. So I was auditioning with these other people who really did look the part. They looked like Jack Black. They were like more like the type. But the director took a shine to my comedy, sort of like my style, um, which is not really a style necessarily. I think it's just who I am. Um, sarcastic, sardonic, whatever you want to say, but with a heart of gold. Um, and so I would... I came in and I auditioned a couple of times, sang, did all the stuff you usually do. And then for my last callback, they had me um, read this big scene in the beginning with Dewey and the kids where he meets them for the first time and he's hungover. And it's this kind of incredible scene that's very sets up their relationship. And I memorized the scene and I did, I think, a really good job. And, and the reader, uh, there were two readers um, because there were so many kid roles, they were just having to kind of trade off. And we had a great time and I thought I did well and I left and I said, okay, great. I, whatever, you know, that felt good. I think I left everything on the table. And then they called me back in and I was the only one they called back in. And the director, Lawrence, um, Lawrence Connor, he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity that not most actors get, but I think you can handle it, which is I want you to do the entire thing over, which is a huge scene. It was like 11 pages, but I want you to make everything up because I want you to just forget what you learned and just improvise. And the readers will try to keep up with you because he knew, I think, that I did improv, that I sort of was like game for this. I just don't think he knew or they knew how much I had done it because I, was, I really do thrive doing that. So in my head, I was like, oh, perfect. And so I did and I, I mean, it was like 10 to 15 full minutes of just 
created material in front of these people for free, which is, you know, a pretty big deal when you're asking an actor to really do, like, really do the thing. Um, and I did, I think I delivered and I felt it in the room. Like when I got done, I felt the table, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Julian Fellows, Lawrence Connor, all the rest of the people, I felt them sort of, I don't want to be too grandiose, but like, I did feel like a change had happened in the room. Like something, someone, a couple of people might have not been sure about me. And in that moment, they were like, this is the guy. Um, and I walked out going, I, in the, my heart of hearts, I went, I think that might have just sealed this for me. And yeah. so, and then, you know, that, I think that night they called and they were like, we want you to do the workshop. And then from then on, it became, you know, everything, every day of a workshop is also an audition, in my opinion. So you have to keep being good, keep doing the thing that was magic in the room. So I tried and, you know, succeeded most days, failed some days, but that's every, everybody. And then we got to originate. So it was a really unsuspecting thing, but it came out of the thing that I really love to do anyway, which is improvise and create on the spot and just be silly. And that's the best thing, isn't it? You get to do what you the love. The best, the greatest. It's the best. I mean, it's a, it's, it's the, every time a teacher in, in middle school and elementary school told me to stop acting this way. Now, now everyone tells me to do the opposite. Everyone goes, no, no, act that way. Never listen to your teachers, kids. That's right. That's the, <laughs> yes, that's the message. And don't, and, and quit school and do drugs and uh, what else? <laughs> yeah, every, yeah. Everything, everything. Yeah, about. Yeah. Break all the rules. Speed, you know, don't worry about the speed limit. Do over the speed, everything. Yeah. What was your musical theater training and background like? That's a great question. I don't get that question a lot. That's a great question. It's such a simple one. And we should ask more people that. Um, so I started doing musical theater when I was eight years old. I, I saw a show. There's a big story about, you know, that I tell all the time about going to see a show at the Winter Garden when I was a child and, and loving it and loving the whole experience. And, and then I came home to California and begged my parents to do whatever that was. And they, they found a place after a year because I had to wait this excruciating um, year of like, because you had to be nine or something like that, or eight and a half to do the shows. And I auditioned for A Christmas Carol, uh, which was uh, the very first show I ever did. I played Tiny Tim. Um, and I, my training basically consisted of me doing shows at this one theater company in San Jose, California, called CMTSJ, the Children's Musical Theater of San Jose. And that really, for a long time, was my training. Um, there wasn't really a lot of acting classes going on or vocal lessons going on. Like, I learned by doing shows and trial and error and, you know, tripping up on stage and figuring out, you know, where I belonged and who I am on stage and what I am on stage through trial and error and just experience. Um, on top of that, in high school, I found um, improv and really took to that and really was like, this really taps into something that I think is going to be lifelong for me. Um, and that just taught me how to be a much more flexible thinker and actor and a way better auditioner. And just to be able to say, yeah, sure, I'll give things a shot. And I think it makes me more uh, uh, of an asset in rehearsals because you just just, you just try stuff. You're more than willing to try because, and you know that the failing doesn't matter. Um, so there's that. And then I went to NYU for two years out of the four. Uh, I dropped out um, for various reasons um, and some good, some bad, but just mainly just because it wasn't working out. But the training I got there, some of it was um, incredibly vital. Some of the vocal performance training that I would have never known about, some of the vocal technique that I never had um, and, and have now continued to work on all stemmed from teachers there that said, Hey, you're kind of singing wrong. And, you know, and I sort of didn't know what that meant. What they meant was I'm not singing healthily. And because I have this sort of rock and roll pop something kind of voice, I never learned how to control it. I was always fine uh, until I needed help. And so they were the ones that started that. So that's been my training. And up until then, now it's been, now I sort of take voice lessons and, uh, every month, at least twice. And I get, my, my throat scoped by an ear, nose, and throat doctor to make sure that all the damage I've done in the past is not haunting me in the future. Um, and that I can still do things like Beetlejuice healthily. Uh, but yeah, my training was a lot of experience. So it wasn't a lot of like joining up in classes and, and doing a lot of um, assignments. It was a lot of sort of learning by doing. Have you seen any Broadway shows since everything's restarted? I have seen some Broadway shows. And what's cool about that is I didn't, but I, we were trying to figure out what I had even seen because the pandemic wasn't the, I mean, I didn't see shows because I was in Beetlejuice. So I didn't, it was been longer than two years for me. I hadn't seen something because I was in the show. So I didn't get a chance to see anything for a very long time. So I was so excited to go back and see shows. I have seen 
in no particular order, we saw Hades Town, which blew my mind into the ceiling. I had such a phenomenal time at that show and had no idea that like, you think you know, because you listen to the album and I've listened to the album and loved it, but you have no, that's a show that you need to see. That is a show that requires you to be in that theater and, and really sit in that magic. They did such an incredible job with that show, blown away. And I want to, a special shout out, actually, because I think this is worth it. I've said this in private and behind his back, but I have not said, I don't even know this guy, by the way. Um, Andre, Andre DeShield was not in the show that day. It was matinee. And we saw Anthony Chapman Jr., I believe. I'm not sure he's, I, I think it's Anthony Chapman Jr., C-H-A-T-M-O-N, Chapman. Um, and I was astounded by this guy. He took a role that is obviously made iconic by Andre DeShields. This, this guy is, is 40 years his junior. I mean, a young, young, young kid. And he blew the doors off the place. And I just, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. The rest of the cast are as iconic as you think they're going to be. And, and he just fit right along with them. So there was that. Uh, so shout out to Anthony Chapman. I don't know you, but I'm a huge fan. Uh, <laughs> number two, I saw the reopening of the play that goes wrong. It's, it was my eighth time seeing it. It's one of my favorite things ever. It's so, the um, the absolute best. It's the, the, all those, I mean, those guys, the, the, the mischief, um, theater company, right. Yeah. That's who they are. They're unbelievable. There are some of my favorite things I've seen. And, and that show is the quint that if you want to know my sense of humor, it's that show from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, I was the, I think it was my eighth time seeing it and their stage manager was our stage manager for Beetlejuice. Um, and he knew that it was coming back and at the Broadway flea market said, do you want to come to reopening night? And I said, yes. <laughs> so had a blast there and then saw the reopening in the second row. I saw the reopening of Phantom of the Opera where Angela Weber was DJing afterwards. And he can't, it, it was, so I'd seen Phantom maybe, I don't remember when, but a uh, while, why, uh, you know, not that long ago, but not that soon. And I was in like the, I was in the balcony. So it's very difficult to appreciate, but second row phantom, that's a real different story. That, that makes you remember how big of a show it is. That is, if you, if you haven't seen phantom in a while, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, it's worth a go and it's worth the orchestra seat because it is 8,000 people on stage with 800 feet tall sets. It's the biggest show ever. You forget that because it's been so long since it's been on Broadway. But I had a ball. I really, really, really did. It's not, it's not one of my like absolute favorite shows. Like it's just not, doesn't, but man, it's a good show. Yeah. Um, I really did. I really appreciate you wanting to talk to me, number one. I'm always astounded that people have any interest in hearing what I have to say, but I'm really uh, thrilled that, that you at least did. And for the, uh, you know, two to three million people listening right now because i know that's how many people will listen to this thank you for your time and your ears thank you everyone for listening don't forget you can book alex brightman on broadwayplus.com slash artist slash alex brightman thank you so much alex for being here i will speak to you in part two <laughs> i cannot wait part two and part three and part four and five taylor you're the best and thanks everybody for uh who have who has ever booked me on broadway plus and thanks to those in advance and i really appreciate all of, of the warmth and the kindness that has come my way because of it so thank you thank you so much i'll speak to you soon bye taylor bye bye